Hello and welcome to DDO Cast episode 425, recorded live on Saturday or Sunday, April 10th. I'm your host, Patrick. With me this week, we have Chai returning. Hello. Welcome back, sir. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's been a while since we it's been a while since I've been on the show. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, this week's screenshot, Wormbait finds beauty in the night in the Veil of Twilight and the 365th screenshot of the week. Uh, the Veil of Twilight is a beautiful place. Uh, probably top three uh, scenic areas, would you say? Um, yeah, I I like all of the art in the Slayer Zones. Um, each time they put out new content, that's the first thing I go check out. Yeah, this, I, the Stormhorns might have a slight edge. Uh but the, the Veil is definitely one of the better ones. Uh, we like to talk about Notice of Dragons online nearly every weekend. You can watch us through Twitch, YouTube, the DDO forums, iTunes, or from our website at ddocast.com. DDOcast is hosted by Cyber Ears, the awesome podcast hosting network. Shows are usually available within a few days of recording, and the next show will probably be next Sunday. You can stay updated by following us on social media pages or our website, ddocast.com. Uh, there's also a calendar there. You can uh, get store news and... and um, bonus days I put on there as well as when the show is and when uh, we live stream our spot group, which we'll also talk about later. Uh, on the podcast this week, uh, we're going to talk about bards and some thoughts on building them. Uh, and then we've also got a little bit of game news. There's still not a lot of news coming up. But we've got a little bit this week uh, about fighters, uh, so that'll be fun to talk about. Uh, first, uh, I want to give a huge thank you uh, to uh, the Damsels of DDO and for Jerry uh, for hosting the show for me uh, a little bit in the past month or so. Uh, I took about a month's break uh, from doing live shows. I was still around, but uh, I needed to take some stuff off my plate, uh, and those fine folks generously uh, helped me out uh, by taking the show off my hands for a couple weeks and did some recorded shows. Uh, the reason for all that uh which I am happy to announce, I can actually say that, uh, I bought a house, uh, and I moved. Uh, I am, in fact, still moving in uh, and recording this sh particular show from my basement while I wait for carpets to come in uh, with my microphone in my sock drawer uh, and my dresser as a desk. So it's a little bit of a transition uh, this week uh, for me as well, but it's good to be back on the show live uh, and being a part of the community again in that capacity. Uh, so... Yeehaw, we'll, uh, we'll get right into it. Uh, we're going to talk about bards. Um, Chai, why don't we start, what are, what's your experience with playing bards? Um, they're, the char they're, they're the character class that I probably have the most of, and the reason why is because you can build each one so differently that it's not like the last one you built. Um, probably the best multi-classable class, um, and... You know, there's there's so many different things that you can do with it that you know you could have a, an entire group of six and you know yeah every one of them can fulfill a different role. Yeah, I've played uh, one bard mostly. I've um, done a little playing around with some other stuff and some other capacities, but mostly just my one bard, which uh, started as uh, kind of a secondary healer, um, second uh, cleric class. He's more of a casting type. Uh, with Swash, well, he, I also used him as uh, a repeater build <laughs> back in the day. Uh, this is before Mechanic and Artificer, uh, and I had some really nice repeaters lying around that I didn't want to get rid of. Um, and I had an extra feet on my bard, so I took a repeater, uh, and he kind of became my repeater build. Um, it wasn't anywhere near as good as you can make repeater, a uh, crossbow build of any kind now. Uh, but that's kind of where I, the niche that he felt He's uh, kind of filled in my stable. Uh, but he was always kind of a, a healing, casting bard first. Uh, once Swashbuckler came out, uh, by that time, of course, there was Artificer and Mechanics. Uh, that was kind of, my Artificer was more of my crossbow build, so he kind of became uh, more of a, a splash of a Swashbuckler. Um, but I've definitely always kept a, a healing and casting focus in, in my bard. Um, so we'll talk about bards, uh, I think the the place I always want to start with when people ask me about building bards is bards are so versatile, uh, which is why they're a really awesome class. 
But I think there's, there's kind of an easy trap to fall into, particularly if you're new to building a BART, in trying to do too much with your BART. So the kind of general rule of thumb, I, I, a piece of advice I give is start with a focus. What do you want to build your BART to do? Pick three things in order. What do you want him to do? Uh, for my BART, it's healing, crowd control, uh, melee, DPS kind of stuff. Um, what, what do you, how do you kind of start with your approach to BARTs? I typically do melee, then healing, and then crowd control. Um, the ability to have a minimum opportunity cost damage makes me want to go melee most of the time. And then after that, you know, it's just a matter of being able to heal yourself and contribute to group healing. Um, crowd control is definitely something I like to build in because if I wasn't going to do that, you know, there I could. there's other melee classes that I could play that I could more heavily focus on that and not have to worry about it. Um, but there's so many different ways to do crowd control on a bard now too and not all of them have to do with like spell magic and uh, that's another thing that allows you to you know be able to focus on one thing but still be really good at like maybe one or two others. Yeah, there's definitely, it, it's not to say that you, when you focus on like three things, you can't kind of keep other things in mind as well because the bards are very versatile. Uh, but I, I've always liked with uh, my bard, particularly nowadays, you can really fill a lot of roles in the party. Even just the one bard I have, you know, I can be a, a primary healer with him or I can kind of be mostly on the front line. Not, not a tank necessarily, but he can get in there and and uh, dish it out a little bit uh, and have some fun in that way as well. Uh, let's start talking about stats. What stats are important for bards? Depends on your character. <laughs> that one is um, it, it's it's a hard question to answer. Uh, con is important for every character in the game, so I'd probably list that one. But you have to kind of decide what your salient ability is going to be before you even build it. Um, are you going to be like a traditional strength, rage type, you know, high strength score, uh, melee fighter type, or are you going to go charisma and maybe charisma to damage and then try to take on some of those caster abilities as well? Um, I've seen variant builds use intelligence. Um, typically um, for rogue splash trapper style bards and you can get into damage in swashbuckler uh, which is you know you don't have to dip into harper although you may still want to for know the angles anyway um, so it, it all depends on like what you're trying to do and that's probably why you want to decide that first and then go with a salient ability next and then you know raise that one to the highest score that you possibly can no, when you Lessos always always talks about your dandy tank, uh, and is that that's a strength build? That one is a traditional strength build, um, particularly because it works in permadeath scenario where you don't have to be slapping plus seven tomes on it in order to get the prerequisites met for things. And strength is probably the easiest damage stat uh, to bring into line with you know being able to do high DPS. Yeah, there's, there's one way to go. Um, my bard, because uh, I'm taking more of a caster approach, charisma and constitution are kind of the two things that I, I go for. Um, intelligence can be helpful for skill points, uh, but otherwise, unless you're doing harper tree, uh, which personally I I probably underutilize <laughs> across all my characters because I don't really use it much for anyone. Uh, and then... Um, yeah, strength uh, is helpful for because uh, I do still do some melee and I I don't do anything creative with my to hit uh, modifier. Uh, it's still strength, but I do use charisma for damage through the Bard and Hands Tree, which we'll talk about. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But it, it does simplify things a little bit uh, <laughs> in terms of how many stats you're trying to maximize out. Because you know, as as a caster, I want more charisma for my DCs and stuff uh, like that which 
is already a little bit of a challenge with a bard compared to, say, a wizard, uh, who are you going to be utilizing with similar spells? Um, but yeah, it's definitely a good place to start is to determine what kind of bard you want to be uh, in terms of that uh, for stats. Uh, let's talk about races. Uh, do you have any races that you particularly enjoy playing for bards? Or what are some good races for players to consider? Um... Purple Dragon Knight particularly synergizes with the uh, spinning ice stuff in uh, in War Chanter. Um, probably human for the extra feet and the stat versatility. That that's I've seen a lot of builds as just straight up humans. Um, <clears throat> if you're gonna go caster. Drow is probably a solid choice because they get that extra bump to enchantment DCs, and then they're also you can max out their charisma, and uh, you can start at two higher, and then you can get two more for racial. So you're really getting the plus three enchantment DC, and you can take charisma to damage. So you're not you're not going to suffer there for having done so. The nice thing about Drow, which is what my part is, is the plus two to intelligence, which is a, an extra skill point. Uh, particularly since intelligence is a dumb stat on my character, uh, so it's, it's nice to only lose one skill point per level uh, in that regards. Humans get one skill point per level just for being a human. Also true. I'd say Drow and Human are probably the two most popular uh, bard builds. Uh, you do see some pe people, uh, I've seen some dwarf bards <laughs> uh, kind of for flavor. You're actually playing one, um, which is kind of a fun little flavor uh, build. Uh, I think Drow and Human are probably the two most popular. Uh, let's talk about feats. Uh, well, you're going to take a more of a melee approach. What are kind of the, some of the feats that you generally are looking to take? Um, choose a combat style, and you have to decide at that point if you're going to be, um, you know, more power attacky or more like weapon finesse. Um, if are you going to be tier five swashbuckler, uh, or if you're going to be tier five something else? Uh, I think you could still, if you splash a bit, you could still fit in some of the caster feats, and you could still get away with doing some of the DC stuff. Um, usually. Like straight up three combat feats, power attack, uh, improved crit, like those kind of melee feats. And then sometimes I go into like splashing for tactics and taking uh, some fighter stuff as well, uh, depending upon if I'm, you know, trying to build for that as a form of crowd control. Um, the Probably the biggest one that I always take on pretty much every bard that I've ever built is Quicken. Because mobs in especially epic and legendary elite quests hit for higher than you can probably get a concentration score of. So it's much easier to heal yourself and others if you are if you just turn Quicken on and not have to worry about uh, flipping skills into concentration. Yeah, it's a, Quicken's a great one. Um, I, my bard, cause again, so I'm kind of taking a, a, a caster approach. Uh, I like Maximize on my bard um, because it helps with healing and with some of the damage spells that, that I can cast. Uh, it's not as mana efficient as Empower Healing uh, for the healing aspect, but it's more versatile. Uh, and because because of the way that I, I build my bard, I kind of have to make some choices about which feats am I going to take and which ones am I not going to take. Uh, I do take the single weapon fighting line. Uh, but I don't have room for improved critical, for example, uh, just because of the, the amount of feats I'm taking. Um, I like extend because of the uh, displacement and haste, uh, or and rage are, are kind of three spells I'm constantly casting as a bard. Uh, I think there's also neither one of us kind of mentioned it as as a primary focus uh, on our bards, but bards bring a lot of party buffs, uh, and with their songs, which we'll talk about. Uh, there's a lot of options there. Uh, I've kind of waffled on, on losing Extend uh, for something else. Uh, but I kind of also have to face the fact that I'm pretty terrible at rebuffing myself when spells run out. 
um, with consumables or spells. So having extend is I've found to be helpful for me. Um, you can also take if you're going to go really more into caster focus, you can definitely go with uh, enchantment uh, DC uh, uh, spell focus stuff uh, that can really help your spells as well. Uh, so you can do uh, you can do uh, improved sh uh, shield mastery, the shield mastery feats, uh, which can help you be more survivable if you're doing the swashbuckling with a buckler, uh, is a good option. Uh, yeah, typically if I splash fighter levels, I take those. Yeah, that's a, a good way to go uh, for that. Uh, some other f uh, feats that I, I like to mention, uh, Inspire Excellence, which is a, uh epic feat, uh, is plus two to all stats in a song, uh, which is a really nice buff for everybody in your party. Uh, and it's, you know, plus two to your stats for yourself is is still decent. Uh, but when you start stacking it, like, say, in a raid group now, 12 people getting plus two to all stats is it's a lot more bang for your buck than you might think about. Uh, the other one I like to kind of use is Force of Personality, which lets you use your Charisma modifier instead of your Wisdom modifier for will saves. Uh, it's, to be sure, it's kind of one of those feats that is a luxury feat, uh, but considering the difference between, because I'm, again, building a, more of a caster, and I'm really focusing on charisma, the difference between my charisma modifier and my wisdom modifier, which is a complete dump stat, is pretty darn noticeable. Uh, it, it makes a huge difference in terms of will saves. Uh, there was a question in the chat room, which I think is a good, this is a good place to do it. Uh, it's coming from V Love. Uh, 931. Uh, the question is uh, on a freezing bard multi-class option, he plays 12 bard, 6 fighter, 2 rogue, uh, PDK, 2 weapon user. Is it better to use ranger over fighter because of the 2 weapon fighting free feats? Um, that's going to depend on <clears throat> what you're gaining from each of those. Um, do you want a ranged option? And you know, with fighter, you can pick up. There's a uh, the first in line of the tactics feats, so you can uh, make up for uh, two pluses on your DC that you lost from taking six fighters uh, levels. Um, the way that that works with bard is every other level you get a DC to spinning ice, and um, I think it's called frozen fury, which is like the single target version of that. So with 20 levels of bard, you'd have 10 uh, plus 10 with six levels of uh, fighter and two levels of something else, you're sacrificing eight levels. So you're kind of going negative four in, so you get two back for taking that one feat. Um, then you can go into, because uh, it, it, it accounts stunning things as well, so you could go into uh, Ken's Eye and pick up plus three to stun, or, or to all tactics, and then you can go into Vanguard and pick up another plus three to stunning and actually beat out the loss that you took for your level drain on your tactics DCs. Uh, for your frozen ice. Well, so we're on, the, we're on the topic of of Kensai too. We'll talk about the changes more, but yep. some of the changes that are coming uh, are going to be uh, the. I was just going to mention that. Yeah, what I can't even remember the name. I, I you get a plus one uh, critical uh, multiplier for the uh, level six Kensai core. So depending upon how much AP you want to toss into that. Is that level six or is that level twelve? They bad. are saying level six core. Ooh. I thought the level yeah. 6 one was um, the psionic strength boost. No, that that's, that's tier 5. I'm talking about the actual cores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about the... Um, I gotta look up, look it up. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, the one that they currently gives you plus 8 psionic strength, uh, Power Surge. Yeah. Which is a core ability. That's going to give uh, you plus eight to everything. Yeah, that's they're changing that to give plus eight to all stats, which would be really, uh, really beneficial for a bard. Uh, so typically, on an ice build, I, I, um, I would stick with the fighter levels, unless you're looking to have a ranged option. Um, there are some situations where you can't argue with many shot, and you would get that with six levels of ranger, along with all of the two weapon fighting stuff, or at least the first two tiers of it. Yeah, I would say in general, you're probably going to be happier with fighter levels. Uh, you know, Ranger, you're, you're talking about the difference in two feats. Uh, 
about ranger do you want to take ranger levels for uh, two open fighting and improve two open fighting which you do get for free the thing to keep in mind is as a fighter you're already getting uh, four feats four yeah four with... feats for six levels of fighter uh, yep. which you can use two of those there plus it's you now and I always like to mention this there's actually a fifth feat you get it probably won't help you on a bard as much but you can get tower shields for free as well uh, whenever you take one fighter level so th there's an extra bonus feat there that some t sometimes people miss not necessarily germane to this discussion of bards but uh, but yeah, if you do want a stronger range option, then yeah, you're going to get uh, a couple of ranged feats as well. Although, in fairness, you could theoretically take those feats with your fighter feats as well. Uh, and kind of split the difference, but uh, probably your, with your build, you're going to be more happy with fighter for what you're talking about. Yeah, it's plus two for tactical training, um, plus three for Kenzai on your tactics, so that's five already. And then plus three more um, for, uh, I'm trying to think of what it's called, it's a tier two vanguard ability uh, because Spinning Ice takes stunning mods into account. So you're going to end up with plus eight, which beats out the negative four that you, you're you actually adding four to your tactics by taking that. It's also worth mentioning too that if you're, uh, I mean, I guess he's saying two up and fighting, but if you were to go uh, single up and fighting, which you can still do, you just switch out the two weapon fighting for the single weapon fighting lines. Uh, if you're swashbuckling, you can take the uh, the buckler enhancement with swashbuckling, and then you can pick up the shield feet line, uh, which will give you some more defense on top of that. So there's some there's a little, there's more options to and more freedom with the fighter levels than with the ranger levels. The two weapon fighting on the ice build is probably so that. Um like on that single target version, you're actually making the mob make two saving throws. Sure. So it's much easier to get the crowd control to land than like on a swashbuckler version. Um, I definitely like the swashbuckler version because you get the uh, charisma to damage and you don't have to, the, the single weapon fighting version I should say, because um, that isn't restricted stat-wise where two weapon fighting needs... You know, it has to have a dex prerequisite on top of, you know, whatever your actual damage stat is. The one nice thing about taking your fighter levels, or your ranger levels instead of fighter, though, is you don't have to meet the dexterity bonus for the two yeah. weapon fighting lines. That would unless, you want to take, unless you want to take the greater one, then you still have to meet the greater one because you're not getting that for free. If you don't have enough ranger levels. There's a lot of things to think about there. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit more about multi-class, but I wanted to get that that question in there. Uh, let's talk about skills. <laughs> Perform is probably the most important bard skill because um, it one it gives you access to your songs, uh, two it increases your sonic damage, which you get some you can have some free uh, sonic damage spells. Uh, but the other thing uh, is fascinate is really kind of I think the big usage of perform. Uh, and bard DCs, I think, trail a little bit in wizards. You, you can still get them up there. Uh, but I think wizards have a little bit of a, an advantage uh, when it comes to spell DCs, partly because they can cast level 9 spells. Bards can only cast level 6 spells, so that's 3 DC right there. Uh, but perform affects a lot of things, uh, and that DC is partly based on your uh, perform skill. <laughs> Uh, so you can get that up really high, and it can be really effective when nothing else will. Uh, what are some other skills that you like to take? Um, heal is definitely a good one uh, because it allows you to um, to hit yourself with uh, higher value spells, uh, and it's practically, I mean, for skill points. You're talking basically spell power for spell or for skill points at that at that stage. That's probably one of the easiest ways to get that. Um, use magic device. I definitely recommend keeping that maxed out. Um, then it's usually a choice between one of the social skills, depending upon what type of bard I have. I might choose diplomacy or bluff. Uh, sometimes I like to throw points into listen so I can see things coming at me in stealth even though I don't know what they are. I usually don't take the social feats um, 
mostly from the standpoint that uh, I was, unless I'm on a tank and using Intimidate, you know, I just never really got used to using uh, Diplomacy or Bluff. Uh, and they weren't, my Bard never really was doing enough damage to need to use Diplomacy. <laughs> Um, unless he was intentionally trying to do a lot of damage and actually wanted some aggro. So I never really found that to be an issue. Um, I do like concentration on a bard um, less these days, but my bard tends to get into the thick of things a little bit more because he's using UMD to do scrolling, uh, particularly for raising. Uh, Sometimes that little extra concentration can be really helpful. That's not, gonna, not necessarily going to help you from getting smacked in the face while you're trying to cast, but it does make tend to make a difference for when you're getting shot with arrows. Uh, it can come in handy. Uh, some other ones that I think are, are probably... Haggle is... A lot of people like to make haggle bots with their bards, um, which has kind of always been a, a, a side focus for my bard, is to, to be my, quote, haggle bot. Um, not that I ever took huge advantage of that, but it does come in handy if I need to go buy some scrolls for other characters. Uh, it's a little cheaper. Uh, less of a concern these days than in the earlier days when I didn't have as much cash floating around. Um, the other one I kind of want to throw out there is Spellcraft. Uh, it doesn't improve your um, your sonic damage because that comes from Perform. But I have found with uh, once you get into Epic Levels and Epic Destinies and you're using... Uh, some other some abilities that use spell power, it can be helpful to have spellcraft. Uh, a little extra bonus there if you, if you have some skill points left over, because uh, bards do have a lot of skill points. Uh, obviously, if you're doing a trapper build, you need to, to focus on some trap stuff as well. Jump and balance are always popular ones as well for me. It's usually where I put extra skill points on any character. Anything else come to mind? Um, not off the top of my head. No. All right, let's talk about spells. Uh, like I said, bards only get up to level six spells. Uh, the heal, the cure spells are always really nice uh, and are good things to take. Um, I think beyond that, dancing sphere and irresistible dance are probably the two that you're going to be using the most. Uh, they're kind of the the bread and butter of crowd control for bards. Uh, I also like Hypnotism and Mind Fog because they reduce will saves, which can be helpful. Uh, and I'll throw in an honorable mention, even though we'll talk about enhancements, there's a, a mass hold spell-like ability you can get uh, in Spellsinger, which is pretty nice, uh, along the same vein. Uh, do you have any spells that you particularly enjoy using for your bards? Um, I pretty much take the combat spells first, so um, stuff like Displacement, Haste, um, blur, rage, especially on the strength builds. Those that that's the kind of stuff that I dip into before um, before I start going crowd control, unless it's like a brand new level and it's really really juicy, like the dancing spheres um, autos, where you can pretty much get everything on the board with. Should give a, an honorable mention to uh, to Master Touch. Uh, it probably won't affect most bards because they're probably going to be using uh, weapons they can they're proficient with anyways, and it doesn't give you exotic proficiency. But if you happen to find a weapon that you really like to use uh, and you're not proficient with it, uh, I've never had a problem fitting it in on my level one spells in my bard. Uh, so you can use any simple or martial weapon in the game. Uh, without having to be proficient with it. It might monkey with some of your other things like single weapon fighting, but it's kind of nice to have. If you need to pull out a bow or something, <laughs> that's when it, it tends to come in handy pretty well. Uh, let's talk about enhancements. Uh, and I think what we'll do is we'll kind of go by tree uh, and kind of think what are the things that you like out of we like out of the different trees. Uh, and we'll start with swashbuckling. Uh, and since you're more of the melee guy, why don't you go first? Let's see, swashbuckling. I'm actually pulling this up right now. So my template typically includes 
uh, fast movement because that, like having 1% level or 1% per level means you're not getting there last and basically piking. Um, I usually take the dodge stuff in Swashbuckler, which includes the items in the cores, but then also the plus three dodge, and usually go for the uh, skirmisher um, <clears throat> enhancement, which allows me to get or wear a shield and then get 10 more percent to dodge. Uh, resonant arms, because most of those builds are high crit chance builds, and every time you crit, you're gonna you're gonna include your sonic spell power in sonic damage. Um, that one is very decent. Um, all the cores that you can get, because each one jacks up your double strike, and uh, some of them give you plus one to damage, um, and then add to your dodge cap. Uh, the style I'm trying to see what this is actually called because I know what I, it's called low blow um, it's basically a trip that relies on your perform DC so it's about as close to no fail as you can get for trip and then the insta kill um, which is coup de gras and that is another as close as you can get to no fail um, this actually fails more because you miss on the swing than it does because of the DC because usually you can get a high enough DC that this won't even be challenged by mob saves. Is that perform um, based too? Yes. Yep. You can usually have a DC in the hundreds on that and then I mean you, you most of the time you fail it's because of like a a glancing hit or whatever grazing blow or you didn't meet the requirement of them being card controlled. Yeah, that can happen. Yeah, it's a it's a good tree. Um, it's a tree that I, for whatever reason, oh, I mean, probably because my bard is not heavy, swashbuckling focuses more on other trees, and I like them a little. I love Spellsinger uh, as a bard, so I, I tend not to go too far. But the thing I like about the swashbuckling tree is you can really get a lot of bang for your buck without getting too crazy and spending. Uh, my warlock actually has three levels of bard, three levels of fighter, uh, and is a swashbuckling kind of fey buckling style. Uh, and with not a lot of commitment to uh, this tree, uh, I get uh, damage, charisma damage, uh, and I get to do single weapon fighting with a buckler, uh, which is really nice. Uh, and swashbuckling. Uh, so that you can get a lot of bang for your buck out of that tree, even without doing a heavy investment. Uh, and, yep. And it, it really, really makes a difference in what your character can do if you can do the swashbuckling. Uh, particularly if you want to have that buckler in single open fighting, it's fantastic, even with a low investment. Especially on, like, if you're playing a different class and you're using the bard class as a splash. Yeah. It's, it's really great for that. Um, and of course, if you want to go go higher, and you can go up higher in the tree and get even more bang for your buck. Uh, let's talk about War Chanter, uh, which is probably my my bard again. He's casting focus, but does does melee. Kind of the the way that I approach is I I put as few points into swashbuckling as I can to get the things that I want, uh, which is basically uh, the buckler the use bucklers while swashbuckling and single open fighting and charisma to damage. Uh, and I, I pick up fast movement out of that because it's it's on the way. Uh, and then I put a whole bunch of points into Spellsinger, and then whatever's left ends up in, in War Chainer, uh, which I like the stuff. That, there's a lot of stuff in War Chainer that increases your positive spell power. Uh, and I like the Greater Heroism song, uh, but most of the other stuff I kind of pick up because uh, I need to spend some points, uh, uh, and I'm trying to get higher up in that tree. But there are some select PRR out of there as well. Uh, anything you particularly enjoy getting out of War Chainer? With a lot of bard levels, if I'm actually playing a bard, the crowd control stuff uh, is oftentimes overlooked. Um, it It's some of my favorite crowd control uh, abilities to play because it hits things that uh, most other mobs that you can't crowd control or that you would need a different type of spell to crowd control, it'll still get those 
Uh, I don't have to worry about, is it undead? I need a different spell. Or is it a construct? I need a different spell. Nope, I can still freeze it. And I still get my 1.5 times to my damage while it doesn't get to hit back. The Frozen Fury en en Enhancement, uh, that one is, you can play it almost like a monk plays their Stunning Fist. It's six second cooldown. It has a, if you're a Charisma uh, build, it, it has a really decent DC on it. And you just just use it as liberally as possible. It only costs you one spell point. Um, just about everything in the game can be frozen. There's a few things that cannot, uh, including bosses, but there's a few trash mobs that cannot. Uh, most of the other stuff can, and you just use that as liberally as possible. I keep uh, meaning to take a, a closer look at, at utilizing that. I'll probably do it on my next the next uh, Epic Life kind of look more at, at using that. Yeah, even if you only go up to tier 3 War Chanter, you pick that up, and you've you've got now essentially a, a crowd control that's charisma based and bard level based that is it cools off every 6 seconds. I do Probably wanna, one of my favorite abilities. I do want to mention out of this tree, you can get to the point where you can use medium armor without uh, arcane spell finger, failure. Uh, Bards can already use light armor without that. It's nice. Um, my general thought on it is you can get more defense by using bucklers and s splashing that in. Uh, but if, uh, like the guy who was asking about two oven fighting, uh, you might find that you want to do medium armor instead. Although that would that would kind of monkey with some light armor uh, stuff from Ranger uh, and would also negate your evasion. But if you're splashing fighter. Uh, and you're two up and fighting, you can use medium armor and then use the stalwart defender line to get some extra hit points and stuff like that. So there's some options there. I have a uh, two-handed fighting version of that build that uses medium armor because he can't wear a shield, and that's how he qualifies for the stalwart, the stalwart stance. Yep, that's a great way to do it. Uh, so let's talk about Spellsinger, uh, which is my personal favorite tree for bards. Uh, there's a lot of DC, plus to DCs, uh, for enchantments in here that I always like. Uh, I like the hit point and spell point songs, although part of the reason I'm taking some of this stuff is because I'm, I'm going for the capstone, because I really like the capstone here. Um, you can get longer songs. Uh, I like, there's a low-hanging fruit here. Uh, it's magical training that gives you uh, extra spell points, but it also gives you at the third tier Echoes of Power. Uh, which bards don't normally get. Uh, you have to take, either take the feat or take that enhancement line, uh, which, you know, getting up to 12 spell points isn't a whole lot, uh, but it can help with certain things, particularly like you're mentioning your the freezing ability that costs spell points. Uh, so when you get get low, uh, this can be an option for you. Uh, there's uh, of course the there's songs in here that uh, I'll give everyone in your party uh, plus one to DCs with their spells and lower spell point cost, which is great. Uh, I like the mass hold spell-like ability. Uh, I've had some fun with that as well. Pair that with uh, a hypnotism. Uh, just make sure the hypnotism isn't heightened or you'll be burning a lot of spell points. Uh, cast hypnotism, then a mass hold. That can get a lot of a lot of bang for your buck. Uh, and I really like the capstone out of here. Uh, it gives you the heal spell and it gives you Whale of the Banshee. Uh, and if you have been listening to the show for a while, uh, you may remember there was an episode where Chai and I were debating... <laughs> Um, capstones, I think it was. Uh, or we were debating something, but I know this one came up. Uh, and I, as, as part of the debate, I, I pointed out that whale doesn't really land very well because you're a bard and you don't have necromancy disease yeah. generally. Uh, but it does reduce, it does give negative levels, uh, which you were absolutely right to point out. You can um, you can use it as a deleveling device, even if your DC on it is garbage, um, and and you cast it and then you can either start swinging your weapon or cast something else because it's still going, still debuffing all of the mobs around you two at a time. Um, heal spell is nice to have. I definitely like uh, some of the tier 5 stuff in here that adds to DCs. The, the cores make up for the fact that you only do get six levels of spells um, as four of them add plus one. If you're trying to go into enchantment, you can then take the Marigold Crown for plus one. 
and then you do get a couple of uh, higher spell pen uh, bonuses as well. Uh, Song of Capering uh, can be decent when you really, really, really want to land something because that one is perform based and it's probably not going to fail unless the mob rolls a 20 on its saving throw. Um, it's, it's only single target, but it's probably going to land. And it doesn't do a uh, spell pen check either, so all of this stuff that has these huge uh, spell resistance scores that, on uh, Legendary Elite, you can probably get uh, crowd control to land on something if you really have to. You should also mention, I don't think I brought it up, uh, Reverberate, which is uh, a dot, a sonic dot. It's not as powerful as the Tier 5 uh, Sorcerer ones, but it is an SLA, uh, which means the meta magic for it is free, uh, and that can really dial up pretty well. Uh, I have actually utilized that, I was utilizing that heavily for a while, because for some reason, unknown to me, for probably a month, I was one of the dragon tanks in Fire Hunt Thunder Peaks just because of what everyone seemed to be running. I always ended up with one of the dragons, and Reverberate was how I kept Acro. <laughs> I could fire it and run away. Um, I think that about covers it for enhancements. Is there anything else you want to bring up for enhancements? Or maybe uh, you should probably talk about, because your dandy tank uses some enhancements from other trees. Uh, maybe you want to mention those. It goes heavily into Stalwart Defender. Uh, nowadays, you can spend less in Stalwart Defender and then uh, go Stunning Shield as well because you can get a pretty sizable strength score with that. Um, I do use either a Favored Soul or a Cleric level to get Divine Might to uh, crank up strength even further. Um, you can get a strength score into the 80s uh, on that, and you don't have to invest heavily into tomes and things of that nature in order to make this thing work. Um, so Stunning Shield is definitely going to work for you. Um, Do you actually utilize the shield stunning part of it, or is it just kind of for your ice uh, stun? Uh, no, that that one doesn't use War Chanter uh, as much. It doesn't use the Ice Crowd Control because it's a strength build. Um, it actually uses Stunning Shield from Vanguard. Okay. Gotcha. And that one is another one that lands on stuff that is questionable. <laughs> I've seen Undead <laughs> stunned with it, and I'm not sure if that's supposed to be the case or not. It's been brought up. Nothing's really ever been said. Um if anything's ever been said, it's probably not supposed to work that way. Well, they haven't really denied it, and it's been in play for multiple years now. So I'm not sure, you know, if... Uh, Usually uh, the silent stance is... It'll just get fixed It's not su at some really point. supposed to work that way, and we're not going to yeah. comment it, but we're probably not ever going to get around to it either. That's kind of how I generally interpret that a little bit. It doesn't work on everything that uh, Freezing Ice works, but it still works on a lot more mobs than, like, say, regular Stunning Blow or Stunning Fist would work. You kind of have to trial and error it to see what it works on and what it doesn't. Uh, let's talk a little bit about gear. Uh, what are some things that you look for that are kind of out of the... I mean, obviously, okay, spellcasting gear and healing gear... Uh, we're going to be looking for that as a bar and going to be doing at least some of that stuff occasionally. Uh, but what are some other things you're looking for on your bars? Some of this uh, insightful gear is throwing me for a loop now uh, because it used to be just straight stat and then you knew where you were going to get your in insightful and exceptional stat from because there were specific items in the game that you know you were going to get that from. And now... It's like the random gear can give you insightful devotion, for instance. Um, you can save a feat if you want and not take empowered healing and then get an insightful devotion item and end up at the same healing or similar healing than as you were before. Or you can crank it up even more by having both. Um, insightful spell power for each version of spell power. Um, insightful stats are now at like plus six for the easy to get variety and then you can get quality bonuses on top of that to, to really jack up DC stuff uh, especially for spinning ice in, in your charisma 
uh, working on that. That uh, that's been throwing me for a loop because, as you know, the the number of skill slots or the number of uh, gear slots uh, that you have didn't get any larger. So there, it's fitting that all in. You pop one thing out, and now it's like playing a game of Jenga again to fit it all back in before the thing topples over. Uh, all of that new gear, I'm looking forward to the uh, the new Kenneth crafting whenever they do that as well. Um, as far as weapons are concerned, I'd probably, you know, I'd line up a weapon for probably levels 1 through 8, and then at that point you can get a 1.5 weapon, um, and then from that until, like, you can get a 2.0 weapon. Um, Vorpals are super low level now. I mean, you can have Vorpal at, seriously, level 2 if you want. Um, so that that has been all throwing me for a loop yeah, as far as, as lately because it's kind of hard determining what my maximum stat could be at, say, level 14 compared to what it used to be. Uh, some of the gear that I, I kind of try to recommend with, with bards, I mean, if, especially if you're doing swashbuckling, then, you know, you're going to be looking at light weapons and bucklers and light armor. Um, I really like the tiller, uh, the epic tiller out of Three Bell Cove. Uh, you know, the, the game doesn't really have a lot of bucklers that I look at and go, ooh, I really want that buckler. But the tiller was kind of the exception to that for a long time. I think the newer buck, the newer bucklers uh, are pretty good out of um, legendary uh, raids, uh, Hound and, and Tempest Spy, and there's a great buckler there as well. Yep. Uh, but the tiller one has 10% dodge on it, so... If you're swashbuckling, you've got 20% dodge between uh, the enhancement and that shield right there, uh, which is the main reason why I don't tend to focus a lot on my dodge either. <laughs> and it has a hidden slot. <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's the next one. Um, light weapons uh, are, again, you know, Cotton the Web has some really great light weapons out of it. Uh, you can make cheap Thunderforge uh Weapons uh, for light weapons as well, which I, I like a lot. Uh, there's not a lot of named light weapons that I really gravitate to uh, outside of those when you get into the, the lower epic levels. Skull Smasher. That's going to be the one to get again. <laughs> What's that one do? It, it is a mace, and it has times three crit. It's a light mace, and it's, it's, um, it's like 3.5 D6... And then times three to crit, you only get critical, uh, like for your swashbuckler stance, you only get uh, critical threat for your stance. So if you have six levels of fighter, you're also going to get another crit mod, uh, crit multiplier. So you'll be 15 to 20 times five. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're looking at name stuff, that that's almost like a... a Epic sort of shadow that got shrank down and made into a blunt weapon. That's a great way to go, that's for sure. Where's that one coming? Was that one dropped from? Giant hold. Nice. I have to look more into that. Um, I also want to put a in a, a good word here for spell point stuff. Uh, bards don't get as many spell points as other primary casting classes do. Uh, so you can find that you, if you really like to do a lot of casting on your bard, you might start running out of spell points. Uh, or if you are more of a melee focus, you might not have as many spell points as you would like to have to begin with. Uh, so look for things that uh, give you more spell points to start with. Um, and also things that give you spell points when you get hit uh, are really nice as well. The Torque, uh, the um, Halcyon Boots out of Fallout Truth are another option for that as well. Uh, let's talk about past lives. Uh, what are some past lives you like to have on your bards? Uh, I particularly like... You know, as a casting type, wizard and, and bard past lives are obviously pretty decent because you can get plus one to all spells and plus one to enchantment spells uh, with those. Any ones that you particularly like to get? Um, fighter and past lives give you tactics. So if you're doing the spinning ice thing, those are decent to have. Um, Paladin is good for just about anything because you can get healing app out of that. Uh, barbarian for hit points. Um, Pretty much the usuals. Yeah, that's. 
Uh, Those are the ones that I like to, you know, TR into bards later on. Uh, let's talk about destinies, and then we'll finish up by talking about uh, class splashing. Um, what are some destinies that you really like playing your bards in? See, here's here's one of the things that I like about this class. Uh, not only is it vers- versatile in like heroics, but once you get to epics, there's not too many destinies that I just it's an absolute slog. Uh, Divine Crusader is good uh, because you can you know you put a fire spell power item on, and then you can use consecrate, and you get crit mods and stuff like that. Uh, Draconic is decent, especially if you're a charisma build. Uh, because of all of the uh, the high magic damage stuff that comes out of there that typically bards don't get uh, in their class. Uh, they can augment with that. I loved playing Draconic on my bard. That was a lot of fun. Exalted Angel if you're a DC bard because the cores of this give you pluses to your DCs and you can crank up your charisma in there. Um, not to mention you can fly all over the place with wings. Uh, Fate Singer being obvious, uh, that one was written by Breck, one of the, like, he he was kind of the uh, the bard fanboy as far as the devs were concerned. Um, and if you read through some of this stuff, like, he's got these little quotes f- on each of the abilities that you can choose. Um, when you're done in Fate Singer, you'll have so many songs that you'll just be using them, like, in the middle of battles just to offload them and pretty much stopping everything in its tracks. Fury is good if you're a strength build um, or if you'd like to uh, have no, uh, what do I want to call it, no DC crowd control. Like every time you just, every time you use one, it just knocks something over and gives you 1.5 damage. Uh, Dreadnought, that one is obvious as it's probably the optimal melee uh, damage destiny for pretty much any melee character. If you want, if you're just looking at melee damage, I think the only destinies I really struggled with on on this carrot or my bar was uh, the Grand Master, which if you're not a monk is kind of a slog for just about anything, unless you got some wisdom DC stuff you can really go after. Um, Magister was okay. Uh, Shradi was kind of eh. Um, it's not really. It's, I mean, it's kind of more of a range tree. There's some, you can some fun stuff you can kind of start to pull off with some of your spells. But um, those are kind of the three that that were the the hardest to get through. But it, even then, they weren't as bad as some classes have been. Yeah, I I probably had to play through two of those and dumped all my saga XP into one on just about every bard character that I've played. It's a good strategy. Uh, so let's talk about uh, classes to splash in with your bards. Uh, we've already talked a lot about fighter, uh, which is really good. When we talked a little bit about ranger, um, rogue splashes are really good. Uh, you've got a lot of skill points as a bard, so you can keep up those skills, the trap skills, really easily. Uh, any other? Uh, you mentioned uh, a divine class. Uh, uh, one level of either cleric or favorite soul. Most people choose Favorite Soul because it gives uh, more uh, spell points for that level. Um, and it's also charisma-based, so you don't have to slog around for a wisdom item to wear to cast your level 1 cleric spell. Um, I usually take the two spells, uh, Night Shield and Protection from Evil. And those are situationally, like if you're, if you're ever getting bombarded with magic missiles... Night Shield takes that right out of the equation and protection from evil if you fight vampires or things that dominate. Even for the five-minute buff that it is, I mean, you're going into that battle like you're you're running around in Temple of Vol or something like that. It's great. Um, also, then you, com- it blocks greater command as well. You run into a lot of things over time yeah. that, that puts you on your butt with that. Yep. And then um, you take Divine Might and you can get your Charisma mod for to strength for... Uh, two minutes at a time, and it costs a minor amount of spell points, so you can just keep using it uh, pretty much throughout the quest. Yeah, anything else you want to want to say as we close out our discussion on bards? Um, just probably one of the more versatile classes. I mean, a lot of times I look at the LFM and I I see uh, 
different builds and I'm thinking what are they doing with that and it's not really in a negative way because I know that something's up because you can pretty much build it into anything that you want and still take advantage of you know all of its class abilities. I'll just say again as we close the discussion on bards, you know, don't get lost. Stay focused on what you want your bard to do because it's really easy to get sidetracked and do some do too many things with a bard. That's probably Make the only that's probably the only way you can really build a bard badly is trying to do everything that a bard can do. And you're being yeah. so great at any of them. You can do everything at a D level. <laughs> Which Just below average. Yeah, which worked a little better in pen and paper. Uh, you can get away with being a lot more versatile in pen and paper uh, with your bard and be the, the jack of all trades and master of none. But uh, in DDO, just the way that the game is built and, and made, uh, you can be really good at uh, any one of the things that the bard does or bard can do, and then you can be pretty darn good at the next thing, and you can be fairly good at the third thing. And uh, I think that's a, a better way to build your part than go too crazy. Well, with that, let's talk about some of the news. Uh, there's some fun stuff in here. Uh, we'll do the easy stuff first. Uh, DDO was giving away some of the anniversary DDO dice. Uh, they had some extras uh, from people that didn't keep their um, addresses up to date uh, and came back. So they sent them, they did a little drawing uh, on the forums. It's already done, uh, but uh, it was a nice gesture on their part uh, to get some of those dice in more uh, fans' hands. Uh, they are also asking, uh, Cold Blue was, uh, for customer service success stories. Um, they wrote that at, at some point or another, we've all had to contact customer service team. Uh, it may have just been a simple question or a major issue or anything uh, in between, uh, but it made something that made us pick up the phone, write an email, or open up a live chat with support for assistance. Uh, Sometimes that can be a pain, but it has to be. Uh, at Turbine, they pride themselves on customer service. They may not be able to resolve every issue. They try their best to make sure that the su experience with support is a pleasant one. They want to get you back to playing the game. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll link to this post. Uh, they have a link there that they would like. Uh, it's a con completely anonymous. Uh, it's a one-question survey. They want to know uh, what your success stories were. Uh, they want to hear stories about... Uh, your experience with using the customer ser customer service for DDL. Uh, so if you want to do that, yeah, we'll get you in touch with them for that. Uh, the other big news uh, for the week, well, I'll hold that off on that, because um, I've been gone for uh, a month. Um, lag, of course, is still being an issue. Uh, there was actually uh, uh, massively uh, online uh, had a little article about it and got a comment from Turbine, which basically said what they've been saying is that they're aware of the problem uh, and they're actively working to fix it. Uh, they have mentioned that there will probably be a hot fix next week uh, to work on some uh, enhancement stacking issues, uh, as well as uh, they did some tweaks to Argonesson and Sarlona, and they're going to put those on all the other worlds as well. Uh, yes. Anything else that we should mention on the lag problems? I'm noticing. actually noticing that on Sarlona. Oh, yeah? That's good. Um, like, lag can still happen, and it usually happens more in spurts now. Um, I haven't been getting so much of the, like, complete freeze until everybody dies and then we can all run around just fine style lag uh, as of yet. And we played through some of the culprits uh, of that, uh, like some of the newer raids, uh, especially, you can experience that in. Um, probably like the raids that were made in like the last year or so. And I haven't been seeing as much of it. I'm seeing more of the like stuttering, like your character was standing here, but now it's standing where it was like a second ago. But it usually doesn't keep happening over and over and over and over again and paralyze you while the mob just gets free reign on killing your character off before you can move it out of the way. Um, so that's at least a step in the right direction. Uh, I'd like to see that, you know, continue to improve, but, you know, whatever they did to Sarlona definitely uh, has helped out. That's good news. You know, there's, there's also an issue with Guild Renown right now as well, where you get Guild Renown, and if you got a lot of people in the party, it can hitch up the, the game a little bit. Yep. I've noticed some things that are, like, completion status style things. Like, um, I was playing 
in a quest where I got a uh, like a monster manual tier and it granted me X amount of experience for killing so many monsters and next thing you know I'm lagging out for like four or five seconds. Yeah. Um, quest completions can do it. Uh, some of the optional completions can do it. The ones, especially the ones that grant you like significant amounts of XP. Like if you go into Madstone and hit that up and kill all the mobs in the beginning and you get that grant of XP right away, I've seen lag there. Um, so anytime I think that the server has to update your character, um, like your character sheet on the fly while there's like a lot of other stuff going on, you might notice it a little bit more. It's, yeah, you've seen that uh, over the years, really. Uh, stuff like that kind of comes up. So, uh, so let's talk about the uh, kind of the big news for the week. Uh, the devs let us take a look at Kenzai and Stalwart Defender changes and what they are looking at for that. Um, they're looking to improve fighter to make it more competitive. Uh, they've already begun the process by allowing fighters to take feats to add uh, tactical bonuses and uh, extra mitigation. They want to further boost the class with enhancement tweak changes. Um, so there's some tweaks to Sour Defender and some fairly solid uh, campsite changes. These will probably also be further tweaked uh, as to get more uh, feedback from players. Uh, so Star Wars Defender, uh, they're changing stand fast to when activated you also gain plus four bonus to all saves for 20 seconds. Uh, and they're also uh, in changing the passive portion of the capstone last stand to be plus two constitution, plus two strength, plus ten PRR, plus ten MRR, and plus two to the DCs of all tactical feats. Uh, in Vanguard, they're fixing the bug with the DC of shield charge. And then Kensai. Dear mother of God. <laughs> Fixing the bug? Oh, yeah. That thing has had, had, had the number 40 on it, regardless of what I've tried to do. It just sits at, at 40 and pretty much fails after you hit that threshold all the time. Yep. That, that, would, be, uh, that would be kind of the problem there. Uh, so, Kensai, uh, for the core abilities, uh, strike with no thought, you get a plus one confidence bonus to critical multiplier. Uh, which is pretty low-hanging fruit. Uh, that's was that level. You said that was level six, right? Yep. The tier three core, which is like the first yeah. one is level one, the second one is level three, and then the third one is level six. Uh, so that's that's pretty slick right there. That's really early for a critical bonus of any kind. Um, I mean, that's before you can even get improved critical by two levels. Yep. It doesn't stack with other improved crit mods. Uh, of the same or uh, sorry, of critical multiplier mods of the same type. Right. So that's why they can hand it to you at so low, and then uh, you know not have you get twelve levels of another class and then get another you know, one. Stack them up, so to speak. Right. Uh, they can, however, uh, power surge, which we're talking about earlier, is is changing. Uh, this is probably the one that I would be a little surprised if it didn't change a little bit. Uh, you gain plus 8 psionic bonus to all attributes for 20 seconds. If you possess the ability to generate key, you gain plus 2 key on hit as well. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, plus 8 to all stats for 60 seconds. Um, and I was actually, we were talking about this uh, with, with an, um, a sheriff who's on the show occasionally. Um, and it, it seems really strong, uh, but I, I think a lot of people were, are the knee-jerk reaction to that is to say, oh my gosh, you can splash six levels of fighter and get plus eight to all your your uh, stats. That's going to make caster DC is really high and this, that, and anything. Like, well, you got to give up a lot of levels of... you got to take a lot of levels in fighter to just to get that. Well, so, I mean, break that down. So you're if you're a wizard, right, how many DC are you getting for your capstone? Usually at least two, right? Usually. Uh, probably more because... Some of them, it's it's like plus four intelligence, or I guess they're plus two intelligence. Those yeah. ones. And then, and then I think one of them has to do with like uh, I, I want to say it's the uh, pale master one where you get another plus at level eighteen for for being in uh, lich form. Right. Um, so that's going to get taken away as well because you won't be able to get eighteen levels. Uh, so you're at negative three DC. Well, what you know, what does plus eight give you? Uh, the 4 DC, um, you're losing spell levels because you're not going to be able to cast level 9 
uh, spells or level 8 spells. So that's two more DC gone because you can't heighten everything now. So you're actually one in the hole. Yes. Uh, but you're only one in the hole. So if you want to make a melee wizard and have six levels of fighter and be able to you know, competently melee, you can do that, but you're not going to be overpowered caster at the same time. Yeah, I think that's where like, the knee jerk reaction is, oh my gosh, you get plus eight, because there's not a lot of psionic bonuses in the game. Uh, so I get that you know, the knee jerk reaction is that's a lot for a lot of different uh, character builds potentially to be getting. Uh, but I don't, I don't think you're going to see that as much with those characters. Uh, especially since, I think, Power Surge, you need like 12 levels of fighter, right? Uh, yes, and so, here's the thing. Sorry, go ahead. So, I mean, you're not really talking, you're not really going to be building a DC character anymore because you've got to have so many levels of fighter to do it. Now, on the flip side of that, the, the place where I think you you will see a lot of um, maybe increase in that is, is fighter monk builds. Uh, fighter monk splashes can get a really great use out of this because uh, they can utilize wisdom and, and still for their DCs, their sun DCs, and, and still be utilizing uh, the strength and con and, and dexterity modifier on that as well. One of the reasons why this probably won't be overpowered is because the game allows you to consolidate just about everything you want to one or maybe two stats nowadays. Um, it allows that more than it did in any other point in the game's history. So if you wanted to make like an int to damage, you know, wizard and have, you know, a few fighter levels and have some melee feats and, and also be a wizard, you can do that. But now you hit your power surge and you're you know, you're essentially benefiting from eight points of int and eight points of con. That's pretty much it. Your eight points of wisdom isn't doing that much for you. I mean, yeah, it might tack a bit onto your will save, but it's not like, you know, you're not conquering the world because you got eight points and all those other stats. Uh, I think rogues might benefit from it the most, uh, but even then, you know, you're either, most rogues are either int or dex. And then Khan as a secondary stat, um, with Wisdom being like their spot stat. That plus eight to everything else isn't really doing that much that it's going to make, you know, make their character like super overpowered. The other thing to consider with this too is uh, it's an action boost, so it's a limited resource. I mean, you got to, no, you, sure, you can use, you can spread those action bo boosts out a long ways. Um, but it, the nice thing, and, and probably the reason why it won't get adjusted, is kind of what you're talking about. Where, it, I mean, you can literally use any stat in the game for damage on a weapon. Now you have, you might have to figure out how you can do that with certain things. But uh, there's a way to use any stat in the game for your damage bonus. Uh, and if you're playing a fighter, you want to be able to. You know, if it's just if it's just plus eight to strength, then that ability isn't as useful to you uh, in that regard. So, I still like it though because it opens the door for other things than yeah, exactly. Just your traditional strength build. And I think that's why they they made it that way. Is it doesn't matter what you're using as your stat for attack and damage. This will help it. Uh, let's see. The capstone uh, is changing to plus two to all ability scores, uh, and plus four action boost uses. Uh, I think everything else is staying the same on it. Uh, let's see. So that's that's the um, the cores uh, for the actual enhancement uh, in tier one. The attack boost now adds uh, to hit and damage. Uh, they also fixed the bug where the third haste boost says that it lasts for thirty seconds. Uh, it's only supposed to last for 20 seconds. Uh, I think it actually does only last for 20 seconds. It's just a bug there. Uh, reading the wind, the cooldown is being reduced to 15 seconds, and the damage is being increased to 1, 2, 3 weapon damage. Uh, let's see. Tier 2, uh, improved dodge. Uh, is The cost is being changed to 1 per tier. Uh, it also has a, a multi-selector. You can take improved defense instead, which is 2, 4, 6 PRR. They removed weapon meditation. Uh, as that ascetic training uh, condition 
conditioning change to uh, plus uh, is one, two, three, four saves, uh, five, ten, fifteen hit points, and five, ten, fifteen fortification. Uh, weapon group specialization uh, is plus one to hit and plus two damage with one handed weapons and repeating crossbows, one to hit and four to damage with two handed and non repeating crossbows. Uh, they combined uh, the two critical ones in tier three. Uh, so you get the critical damage and confirmed critical hits in the same uh, same enhancement now. They, Im they removed improved mobility and added athletic mastery, which is plus one, two, three maximum dex bonus and dodge cap, and minus one, two, three armor check penalty working for any armor. Uh, Shattering strike cooldown is reduced to ten seconds. Fortification loss no longer has a saving throw and no longer requires weapon meditation. Uh, the weapon group specialization is the same as before. Uh, in tier 4, critical damage from, uh, was removed because it was combined. Uh, they added opportunity attack, which takes two charges uh, for a melee attack. It deals 1, 2, 3 weapon damage. Your melee power is boosted by 10 for 6 seconds. Each time you damage an opponent, but no more than once per second, you have a 10% chance to add a charge up to a maximum of 2. Uh, which, I don't know, it seems kind of silly to me to put something in that has charges just for this one purpose. That was kind of the thing that, that stuck out to me the most out of all this stuff. Uh, there's a new strike at the heart, which your weapons attacks have the improved destruction feat uh, effect, which is kind of neat. Uh, weapon group specialization, you gain plus one to hit and plus two damage, and same as the other ones. Uh, the requirement at this level was also changed to weapon focus, uh, which uh, I believe that you had to like keep getting those uh, for each tier or something like that, didn't you? Before? Yeah, weapon, there's three, even though there's only two weapon specialization feats, there's three weapon focus feats. Yeah. You had to keep getting them uh, to go up the tier, but now you only need it for the fourth tier. Uh, let's see, tier five, uh, a good death, the cooldown was reduced to 15 seconds, and extra damage now activates the target below 30% health, and it scales with melee power. Uh, the requirements were removed, uh, which was uh, kind of nice. Uh, it used to be 20% damage, uh, so they made it a little bit higher. Uh, one with the blade, you also gain as part of the passive bonus, plus 20 to melee and ranged power, uh, which is pretty awesome. B before, it was just you know, melee weapons are now, uh, you can use them while you're centered. Uh, was what all it did. Uh, and Deadly Strike no longer requires an action boost. The cooldown is reduced to 20 seconds, uh, and it changes the on Vorpal ability to cause an extra 500 damage, which scales with 400% melee power. And they're also adding Weapon Master. You gain plus 3 to hit and damage with all weapons. So there you go. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on the Kensai changes? Are they requiring um, you to be centered? Uh, I don't no, I don't think so. It's just uh, your weapon, you can use whatever your focus weapons are and be centered, plus you get the melee and range damage. Or melee I see. Power. So they're not going to undo that. That was one of the things that I was looking forward to to see if they would make that a multi-selector. No, it like, sounds like they're just adding, adding to the bonuses. So, if, I mean, if you wanted to, you could be using Heavy Blades in Grandmaster <laughs> as a monk. Now, the, the other thing about that is you have, you'd have to be using robes to be centered anyway, so you're giving up armor to do that. But they also, I think, uh, they, re they removed all the requirements for it, too, because to get one with the blade, you had to go up this long tree. You had to go up two separate trees that culminated in that to get it. So. Yep. Yeah, there is a, a fairly decent PRR um, uh, path for a monk, but it is a very narrow path. And, you know, I think while it's great that that's a viable build, you know, multi with fighter, I thought it would have been cool if they would have given, like, maybe another choice or two, like maybe made it a multi-selector and said, okay, if you're, you know, if you're multi with monk, or if you're going to be like a heavy armor tank, you can have this benefit instead, or something like that. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I like that they're leaving in that a Kensai can stay centered with other weapons. I think that's a fun, fun aspect of it. I don't know if it's 
how viable it's ever really going to be. Because even when they released it, 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 I mean, let's face it, it wasn't really a popular choice to begin with. Not that people aren't doing it, uh, but it wasn't necessarily the most popular choices. When that first got released, uh, Centered Kenzai was like, they were some of the people doing the hardest content and posting it on the on the boards. Yeah. Um, I think it was like twelve fighter, six monk, and then two. What was it? Either paladin or uh, cleric, depending upon how they wanted to get their strength boost. And nowadays, there is a fairly decent PRR um, Shintao monk path that you can take where you're not really overly lacking in PRR. Um, you'll even be, you'll at least be better than, say, a swashbuckler, and you'll still have your high dodge and stuff like that and be able to use, you know, whatever weapons you've specialized in as a Kenzai. So it's still, you know, it, it's a decent uh, build, but I just, I would have liked to see that, square filled in with multiple things and be able to take different, uh, like for different multi-class um, configurations, um, being able to take some benefit from that rather than only like the the monk version. I get that they want to make monk and Kenzai like the thing, but I don't know. Well, I think this way it's not, it's not... I mean, they took out the meditation thing. It, they're making yeah. it less monk-like and making it more fighter-like, but they're leaving in the... You, If you're Tier 5 Kensai, you can use weapons while centered, which yep. it, I think is a good good place to go. And, and they're making the ability worth it. Regard, I mean, 20 melee and range power is fantastic. Uh, I am very much looking forward to that uh, on my fighter. Uh, so yeah, and the best part is I don't need to because my fighter is twelve fighter, six ranger, two monk, uh, one of those builds, and so he's going to benefit very nicely from these changes, uh, and I'm greatly looking forward to that. Uh, I should also mention that they are discussing the possibility of another enhancement at tier four, but they're not ready to reveal it yet. So it could be fun. Yeah, I saw that, and I was like, <laughs> what? I don't know. Could be something interesting. You want to take a guess at what it might be? I have no idea. <laughs> I suggested some things when I was part of the council, but the you know that would be they would have had to roll through a six-month-old thread in order to get some of those things, and they're probably getting <laughs> most of this feedback from the new, um, the current council. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, there's there's some other things that they could pull in, maybe. We'll see. We'll see what it is. Um, bonus days this week. Uh, you can get plus 20% heroic and epic XP and an additional 5% VIP uh, XP bonus. Uh, which is always fun and dandy. Uh, great timing for me. I've got, because of all the lag and uh, moving and uh, many things, uh, I haven't been raiding as much anyways. Uh, and probably because of the anniversary event, I TR'd some characters uh, just so they could uh, use the XP gem because I knew that the only thing out of that list was worth taking was the XP gem. So usually I have like one XP product that I'm working on, and right now I think I have like five <laughs> projects for XP. So yeah, I'll tell you, uh, Sane Asylum uh, Elite Hard and three normals last night was pretty lucrative. So. Got through that pretty quick. Uh, store news. Uh, you can get plus seven stat tomes through April 14th. Uh, you can also get 20% off of character slots, questing tools, healing items, spell point potions, stat po uh, buff potions as well. Uh, and the freebie for the week, uh, a new one, the Lesser Treasure Hunters Elixir. Uh, you can get one per account there. Uh, I believe that is the new item which increases your chance to get the lucky loot stuff. Uh, community news, 185th Chronicle, the Halfling Summer Games uh, are being joined by gnomes, and they're calling them the Munchkin Summer Games. Uh, Ginger Spice had a new video on Sorta Catra Cauldron crafting. Uh, that is the stuff from the Attack on the Stormreach chain. 
what do you wish you'd known about your artificer? Uh, someone is asking questions about that. Uh, the High Lords of Makir had a legendary shroud teaching raid yesterday on Serlona. Hopefully that was successful and not lag infested. Uh, the Maji Kalwans is the guild for the week, an Orion based, uh, very small guild looking to expand both veterans and with new players. Uh, the guild features characters at all levels and friendly folks to game with. Uh, so you can get in there. Uh, the comment for the week uh, Chai. Cordovan really wants to know, do mind flayers wear socks? <laughs> That's a great question. Any thoughts? Um, I am going to go with no. I'm going to say yes, but not where you think they would wear them. <laughs> Uh, Fansite news. The Unheroics tackled the anniversary event. Uh, the DDO Players News. The latest information from DDO and the world of pen and paper uh, with their new show. Uh, Cordovan uh, gave himself a shout out for guest hosting DDO Cast last week. Uh, DDO Gamer investigated Broccoli and Bacon. The damsels of DDO were in the veil. DDO Wiki uh, has someone watching Twitter. Uh, Even Note has started live streaming. Well done. Uh, the Ordo Syclatica reimagined the monk. Uh, was a good blog on uh, some suggestions for changes to the monk class. Uh, Enrique was extolling the virtues of Scorching Ray, and Tactilicious and Craftilicious offered tips on advance and advice on new random loot. Uh, see, and the other thing to note: uh, the anniversary party is ending next Sunday, April seventeenth. Uh, I mean, kind of, we'll go into the next day until they can turn it off, but. Basically, up until next Sunday. So you have one more week. Yeah, uh, get your freebies. Yeah. Uh, They're free. <laughs> uh, DDO videos uh, this week. Uh, I'm going to link to the Ladies Night Running in the Flesh. That's uh, Bonnie Bue's group. Uh, that does. She's got a whole bunch of videos on there as well. Uh, I'm going to link to In the Flesh. You can watch that and uh, get to know her as well. Uh, and the Shady Rogues uh, had their 10th anniversary challenge. Uh, also, the Cocktailer had their 97th episode. Mentioned it in the Chronicle. Players News uh, was on their 78th episode, and the Dandles had their 39th episode this week. Uh, Dido Kasplat News. Uh, another Dido Cast News. Uh, Dido Kasplat is back. Well, we were back this week. We did Bloody Crypt. Uh, this week, we are going to do Chronoscope in Permadeath on Elite. It will be exciting. Yep, it's e it's either gonna be great success or what what's your new build gonna be? Splat. Well, we've got we've got more lenient rules, so we don't necessarily have to rebuild yet. <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, we're we're a good group of players. We can use tactics when we want to. We might <laughs> actually get through it <laughs> when we want to. <laughs> um. Uh. Other DDoCast news, uh, obviously I'm, I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, I got a new house, I've moved, uh, and I'm back. It's nice to be back. Uh, thanks again to the Damsels and Jerry for giving me a couple weeks off uh, and supplementing my recorded shows that I, I built up uh, with live shows as well. So, uh, yeah, we'll be back uh, next week. Should be back to a normal schedule uh, for me. Uh, other gaming news: uh, Team Turbine is running Relay for Life. Uh, Re Relay for Life. Uh, if you would like to support them, uh, we will be linking to their page in our show notes. Uh, Lightning Post uh, survey question for the week comes from Melly on Kyber, asking, "How do you get Blitz to actually work?" You want to take this one? Um, nowadays, you hit the button. I think it starts off with like three charges. Uh, and each time you uh, swing and connect, you have a uh, small chance to gain another charge, and that charge grants an amount of um, melee power. And um, I want to say the maximum number of charges is 10. Yes. It's been a while since it's I've 10. used it. So it kind of encourages being a little zergy because after you get out of the fight and you've got 10 charges that starts decrementing and you'll see a, a counter uh, up in your buff section on your screen where it's it's counting down to when you're going to be at nine and then that one's counting down to when you're going to be at eight 
So you want to run and find some more mobs and smack those uh, so that you can get it to increment again, back up to 10, and keep it there for as long as possible. Um, that change was, you know, the way, from the way it worked before was pretty positive because now you can use it on things like shroud portals uh, where you know you're going to be there for a while beating on them when they have insane amounts of hit points and DR as that will uh, give you increased damage. Uh, but it doesn't, it, it does encourage uh, being a little bit zergy because you want to always find more monsters rather than, you know, waiting for party members and figuring things out, etc. Imagine adding that to Chris Blatt <laughs> when we get epic. If we make it to epic. <laughs> there's still a question mark on that. Um, yeah. As far as getting it to uh, there's a bit of metagaming that really helps with this. Uh, if you know you're going to be coming up to an area that's not going to have a lot of mobs, it's a bad time to use it. Uh, if you know you're going to be going through a lot of monsters or you're fighting a boss that you know you're going to be hitting a lot, uh, it's a good time to use it. Uh, you, the, the biggest thing about getting Blitz to work is when you activate it, you need to be ready to, you, you need to be able to build up some quick charges uh, is what you really want to be able to do. So, you know, a haste boost, uh, attack boost can be really helpful. Uh, cleave and cleaving works really well here because you can hit multiple monsters at the same time, so you can get a lot of attacks uh, and boost, boost that up. Uh, same thing with uh, mini shot and improved precise shot. Uh, you know, you get a couple guys lined up and it will hit a lot of monsters at the same time. That can really help you boost your blitz stack up, up quickly. Um, so it's usually the way I find it is it's important to start it well. Know when you're going to start it and make sure that you can get a nice jump start on getting it going uh, as opposed to there's one big guy in front of you and there's nothing beyond. You may not want to use it yet because you might be wasting the click. So some things to think about. Uh, so with that, thanks, Chai, for joining me. Uh, do you want to plug anything before we head out? Um, Sublime Permadeath Guild, we are on Thalanis. Um, you can come find us. Um, if you search for Sublime Permadeath and Shiv TR, um, as we're, that's what we're using for our host website, you'll find us on the web. Uh, go ahead and read our rule set. You do have to join us level one. Um, we did relax one rule as of late, and that is if you make it to level 20, you can now TR as an iconic. Um, something we've been discussing for a while and has been a uh, topic of discussion as, you know, what people would find more fun. Uh, if you haven't explored Permadeath before, it's a completely different mindset for most of us and uh, unless you're in our uh, static group with uh, Patrick and myself, in which case uh, dying can be comical. But you can get somewhat of an adrenaline rush out of trying to keep a character alive through some things that you wouldn't consider uh, really difficult in like regular play. You know, when you have all of the buffs and all of the items. Um, and so ten if years you're, worth uh, of gear. Yeah, ten years worth of gear. So uh, come check us out. Uh, find an officer. Um, you can pretty much send a tell to anybody that's on at the time in the uh, in the list, and uh, we'll get you invited. And if if you're thinking about permadeath, don't don't think that the way that we play because black group is the way that permadeath groups usually go. Yeah, if you watch the stream, that's uh, it's a really we do a really good job of showing you how not to play permadeath, <laughs> or how you probably shouldn't play permadeath, but we have a lot of fun with it. Um, thanks for listening to the show. Uh, thanks, Chai, for joining me again. Uh, thanks to all the other contributors for DDO Cast, and thanks to Turbine for making DDO and Wizards for letting them do that, and thanks to Cyberbears for hosting the podcast. You can hit us up at DDOcast.com for show notes, our previous shows, uh, MP3s, our calendar, swag, other fun stuff. If you'd like to be part of the show, or have a comment on this episode, if there's a question you'd like us to answer or a topic you'd like to hear us debate, or if you just want to say hi, uh, leave a comment. You can email us at DDOcast at gmail.com. I love hearing from all you folks. Uh, you can also find us on social media and follow us for the latest cast updates. Our closing tip for the week comes from Turbalis on Galanda. Uh, take your time and invite your friends. 
So until next time, may all your attack rolls be crits, all your chests level appropriate, have fun, and don't forget to run the anniversary event. It's your last week. And turn in your tokens. Thank you.